I'm happy to be here again, second time to tell you right to present. I don't know if you guys were here last year to see my talk, but I gave a little bit more of a formal introduction as to my background. I'm not going to do that so much this year. Um, but what I want to do is sort of a continuation of our efforts to do a um, mycoflora, or as Juliana would have me say, a macrofunga project. Um, I'm not as triggered as using mycoflora as some people might be, um, but I do understand the need to maybe um, fix our nomenclature and the way we refer to fungi. Um, that being said, I'm working on the Colorado macrofunga project. And it's a project to better understand the biodiversity of mushroom forming fungi and fleshy fungi in the Southern Rocky Mountain region. And what I'm gonna be doing a little bit is talking a little bit about that and talking about how Telluride can be an integral contributor to understanding the biodiversity of fungi in the region. Talk a little bit about the fungi that we have here or we suspect that we have here. The problem is, is that currently the fungi we suspect we have here is solely based on rumors. And um, these are the suggest suggested species, but we have no proof because we have no vouchered material in places like where I work, which is Denver Botanic Gardens. So first I want to start off with a little bit of background. Um, Southern Rocky Mountain region is an important region of the world. And about a little over a third of the state is forested. That makes Colorado a very unique place to be studying fungi. Because if you look at fungi like I do, you see the, all these plants and trees and forests. And what I see like past the trees, because each one of these trees is essentially a whole community of fungi. So like my initial professor, Dr. Dennis Desjardins, he would say, look at all those mushrooms. Look at all that, look at all those fungi. So I like that and I'm gonna try to convince you that when you see forests like this, you should just see, wow, there must be amazing fungi out there. So I'm gonna frame my talk in terms of the Southern Rockies and the habitats that harbor fungi in terms of three sections. Um, the reality that we have in terms of what fungi bring, the challenge we have to basically understanding fungal diversity, and then how that challenge leads into potential opportunity. So first, the reality. Reality can be heavy. Reality can be daunting. Um, but if you have your coffee in the morning and you wake up eager to look at all these fungi and as optimistic as um, you can see the fungi, you can understand there's great opportunities to help us understand fungi and help us conserve what we have in terms of nature because the reality is it's also heavy without the fungi we don't have forests we don't have the trees and a big reason for that is that plants are shaped by their fungal associations in many many different ways um, all the animals that pretty much interact in terms of the herbivores and parasites on the herbivores can be shaped by whether there's leaf endophytes acting above ground on the plant, and in many ways by the mycorrhizal fungi, the mycorrhizal associations that create chemical cues that affect um, herbivores, affect pollinators, but also affect the interactions between plants and their communities. Many of you probably already know about this. <clears throat> and many of the fleshy fungi and the fungi that are in the soils in these forests are these mycorrhizal kinds. Many of you are probably familiar with the work of Suzanne Samard. If you have ever heard of the term, the wood wide web, Suzanne has been um, integral or principal in um, studying and in integrating this phrase into our lexicon and essentially explaining how a single species like rhizopogon, a rhizopogon species, can create this entire network amongst a community of trees. And so then this figure in this diagram, you've got lots of different colored lines. Each one of these colored lines represents a genet or an individual rhizopogon. All of these different individuals are of a single species in this little network or this quadrant where they studied and showed how, all of, how the single species and all the individuals of this species interconnect all of these plants together. Now, if you can imagine an ecosystem like this harbors thousands of different fungal species and all the individuals within them can imagine how complex this network must be. 
And these fungi connect different species of trees. That's another thing that Suzanne talked about. So these ectomycorrhizal fungi, if you're not really sure, of course I'm sure many of you do know, but the term mycorrhizal means fungus, rising means root, and it's essentially the fungus and the, and the plant interacting on the roots and that interface. And so the important thing I wanted to point out is that all plants sort of need these fungal communities but they don't just need them in terms of their associations and their symbiotic relationships with the plants. They're also integral in conserving our forests and recycling the woody debris and everything that's going on in nature. In Colorado, we have an excess of woody debris that's on the ground. Um, just driving up here, I was driving with my um, comrade in arms, uh, Rick Levy, and we were going over Monarch Pass and we were seeing lots of dead stands of trees due to beetle dieback. That's gonna create a problem down the line because it's timber fuel for forest fires. And so one of the issues is what's gonna to happen to all this woody debris? Fungi play an integral role in decomposing cellulose largely because they're the principal organisms on the planet that can break down the complex carbohydrates that they represent. All cellulose is based on this simple sugar glucose, and it's essentially chemically identical to starch. The difference is starch has all of these chains, side chains, facing upwards, but if you look at cellulose, these side chains alternate in pattern. That simple difference is the difference in our diets between eating a nice bowl of french fries and getting the, the nutrients from the starch versus drinking a glass of Metamucil and having the fiber pass through our body. Our bodies do not recognize cellulose and therefore it passes through our body like fiber, even though it's essentially sugar. Fungi can come along and break this down and turn it into brown rot or white rot and recycle that sugar and that chemical energy back into the environment, converting it into mushroom tissue or releasing those sugars into the environment to be picked up by other bacteria or other organisms that can come along and take advantage of that nutrient cycle that fungi provide. Fungi do this largely by their mycelium. Their fungi or their mushrooms is what we call the fruits, another botanical term. I don't know if you want to change that. But um, fung fungal mushrooms are essentially the fruits of the fungus. It's like an apple off of a tree, you're gonna pluck it, but the tree is left behind. If you pick the fruit of the, the, if you pick the mushroom, you're essentially still leaving behind lots of the mycelium just doing the business end of the work in the ground and in the soil. So Colorado's wilderness really needs fungi. And in order to understand all of the ways that these fungi interact with the environment, we need to start first or principally understanding a lot of their biodiversity so we can understand how each of these species are contributing in their own way to the environments. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. But if you're still around and you're interested in the ways that fungi can help the environment and we can use fungi for bio um, remediation and bio restoration, you should stick around till Sunday when two principal talks by Dr. Lauren Saplicki. We'll talk about her PhD dissertation work on microremediation and Jeff Ravage, who was, who was here last year, but he's a forester over on the Front Range, talking about using fungi to clean up a lot of this dead woody debris in our environment. In understanding biodiversity, there's lots of different species of fungi that are out there, and lots of people have tried to document this over time, and Dr. Meredith Blackwell started creating a graph of how much of our understanding of the biodiversity is growing, and how it's grown since this, her publication back in 2011, um, but still, the reality is somewhat stark in the sense that there's lots of projected species out there. And if we go with David Hawksworth's initial estimate of 1.5 million species, we've, as we only know maybe around 10% of the fungi. Um, recently, with molecular tools, we've rounded up that estimate to upwards of 5.1 million species, which means we know maybe 3% of the total diversity that's out there. So when I'm talking about understanding this biodiversity to understanding how they contribute to the environment, this is a concept of niche partitioning. And I introduced this a little bit last year, but the idea is, is if all of these fungi are working in the same environment, they must be contributing something different to that environment. How these fungi contribute differently so they don't directly compete or directly interact and obscure each other's ability to work together 
is something very interesting, but it's also hard because fungi are so cryptic in their diversity. So this kind of illustrates part of the challenge. The challenge is, what do we know about Rocky Mountain mushrooms? How many are there out there, and how do we recognize them when we find them? And that's part of the issue of this macrofunga project. And something that we're tackling in the San Mitchell Herbarium of Fungi that um, uh, Britt introduced um, at Denver Botanic Gardens. So right now we're approaching about 20,000 collections. Um, those represent nearly 2,500 species. Of those, um, 16,000 essentially represent specimens from Colorado, others from the southern Rocky Mountain regions, maybe outside the states, and maybe even um, other places in the United States as well. The challenge is, is that these collections are largely within a day's drive of the Denver metropolitan area. If you look here where we are in Telluride, our collections are pretty sparse, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. And when it comes to the distribution of the different groups of fungi, these are the genera along the bottom. Sorry if it's too small to see. But Hebeloma here, we definitely have the most of that. And that's largely because Vera Evenson, who's been working in the herbarium for 30 years, that's her baby. That's her project. Um, however, if you compare the total number of species in that group that's in the collections, there's maybe close to 100. But in Cortinarius, we have a ton of diversity at about 131 species. And there's probably way more than that, especially if you go along this tail and look at all the diversity that's there. Now, when I talk about the bias in terms of the representation of distributions, there's, we can also see, according to county, which counties are well represented, such as Gilpin and Clear Creek, which are right underneath this black blob. Guess where Vera Evenson lives? She lives right there. Um, but I really want to understand what's going on on the western slope, this whole this area in orange. And probably two ways of looking at that would be looking at Pitkin County, which is where we probably have the most collections from, and then where we are now, which is San Miguel County and around Telluride. So first off, let's look at Pitkin County. Pitkin County was, um, in the past, was often visited by the father of North American mycology, um, Dr. Alexander Smith, and then um, our herbarium's namesake, uh, Dr. Sam Mitchell, who um, developed a close relationship with Alexander Smith. And they went out into the Rockies and learned. Um, Alexander Smith taught Sam Mitchell a lot about the fungi and how to identify them. And Pitkin County, wh where Aspen is, which is right around there, I think, was a place where they ended up visiting a lot. And so therefore, we, uh, uh, in terms of like counties along the western slope, Pitkin County has the best representation in terms of um, specimens in our collection. And here, based on this graph, you can start, though those visits started in the mid-70s, basically ramped up a lot in terms of the to total number of collections. But you can see after the 70s and every visit since, we are still adding new genera to our collections. We're still learning about more of the diversity. So even though, I mean, we might seem like a steady slope in terms of the number of specimens we're collection, collecting, we still have not saturated the total amount of diversity that we're finding. So every time we go back there, we find something new. If we compare it to San Miguel County, um, what we can see is two different profiles. In the Sam Mitchell Herbarium, the collections that we have are pretty sparse. We have a few collections around Telluride, but if you go on the myco mycology collections portal, or the myco portal as we know it, these are collections not just in the Sam Mitchell Herbarium of fungi, but in all herbaria. Um, because Dr. Alexander Smith came to Colorado frequently and collected around the state, a lot of um, San Miguel collections are in the University of Michigan's herbarium. And so with those collections, uh, we have lots of different diversity, lots of diversity um, in the San Mitchell herbarium, but not, of it, it, not all of it is identified to species. These green bars represent what we know to a species. And then at the same time, every year we come to visit, we're still adding more species to our understanding of what's going on. So. In the Myco portal, there's lots of different specimens, lots of different species. Basically, the collections of the Sam Mitchell Herbarium is still limited. Um, and if we want to use the Sam Mitchell Herbarium as a representation of what we have here in Colorado, 
that's what I'm doing here is trying to up these numbers so we can better research and study the Southern Rockies and what our diversity is. So let's compare it to what we know or believe in terms of the diversity. And we come, and this comes from, you know, one of our um, godfathers, um, Gary Linkoff, and his assessment a few years back of how many species there are in, tel in tel um, Telluride. And he said, I think he came up with an estimate, and this is probably with Noah Siegel initially. Um, you guys can correct me if that's right. Um, but they estimated they have around 300 taxa in all. This is probably a conservative estimate. There's over 230 different um, named species on the list that they created. Um, some of those collections that are probably on that list are currently with Noah, and I'm talking with Noah, he's gonna deposit the, many of those collections in the uh, Sam Mitchell Herbarium. And on that list were species like Rushula xeromphalina, um, common Rushula species that blushes here but also smells very shrimpy. If you're going out and collecting, you can find Rushula xeromphalina. <clears throat> Other ones, the hawk's wings, people often seek this, and if you're willing to part with it and contribute it to science instead of your soup pot, um, please do so. We would like to know the distribution of this species around Colorado. And then last year, I talked about this weird, interesting, beautiful mushroom. Um, we have this image in the Sam Mitchell Herbarium, and it's kind of become the mascot for um, the Colorado Macrofunga Project. But the problem is, is that this does not look like um, Alloclavaria purpurea, which we get commonly here in the Rockies. If you ever find Alloclavaria purpurea, Purpurea, it is a purplish grayish color, not this vibrant violet amethyst color. And the weird thing about this one is that there's little branches at the ends. Alloclavaria purpurea does not do that as far as we know. So I went through this list last year and I was talking about this. What is it? It's, well, it doesn't seem like it's Alloclavaria purpurea. The, another option is Claveria zolingeri. And as far as we know, this does not occur in, in the Southern Rockies. It's branched, it's a little bit more of a violet purple, but we think that this is more of like an East Coast thing, and that there's other features of this um, Claveria zolingeri that is, um, contrasts with what we have of our specimen. Clavulina amethystina is sort of ruled out because this is considered to be limited to Europe. And then the other option would be it's a new species. So, the Mycoflora macrofunga projects, what they're trying to do is not just rely on our morphological interpretation, we're trying to use DNA to help us understand these problems. And so in this last year, I crunched out the DNA, I sequenced it, and lo and behold, we should have listened to our first interpretations. It's just a very beautiful example of Alloclavaria purpurea. Now, what changes what allowed this morphology to happen as opposed to the ones we commonly see. Maybe we just caught this within like the first hour of its glowing. And then normally when we come across it, it's grayed out to this part. What causes the branching? That might be a future research project, who knows, for whatever students. Now, there's other questions. And I think it's appropriate to start talking about the genus Psilocybe because that's a lot of the subject of what's going on this, this weekend here at um, the Telluride Mushroom Festival. One of the challenges is that how, I wanted to ask the question, like how many species of psilocybe we actually have here in Colorado? Now, in the Sam Mitchell Herbarium of Fungi, we looked at the species of psil that are listed as psilocybes, and the reality is we only have psilocybe cubensis in the, the herbarium. But if you look at where those collections came from, they usually say Detective Reinhardt or something like that, or there was some kind of drug bust. So th the reality is, is that Psilocybe cubensis likely doesn't occur naturally in Colorado. Maybe growing out of somebody's bathtub, but not necessarily here. The other species of Psilocybe that are naturally occurring actually have all been transferred to the genus Deconica, which is part of this research, or which is part of this paper that happened back to conserve the, um, the name psilocybe, to refer to largely those species of psilocybe that produce psilocybin. 
the, the traditional or the other psilocybes that don't produce psilocybin were found to not actually be related to those psilocybin producing psilocybes. So as a result, Scott Redhead, um, the father of psilocybes, um, Gaston Guzman, um, they came out with a paper to conserve the genus psilocybe, and then all the other ones went into the genus Deconica. Now, in um, Noah's and Gary's list, they produce a number of different psilocybes. One of them, only one of them happens to be Deconica. The others are actually true psilocybes. Now, I came up with the question, if we don't have them in the San Mateo Barium Fungi, are they actually here in Telluride or in the Colorado region? Well, it turns out if you look at the mycoportal, there are actually these species occurring largely in Ophir, just south of here. All of them are in the Michigan herbarium, but we don't have any in the San Mitchell herbarium. So when you go out collecting and you have psilocybe on your mind, go out and look for the little brown mushrooms. I know the little brown mushrooms are boring, but go ahead and collect them and bring them in and we'll try to put IDs on them. And ideally, up the representation of our psilocybes in the San Mitchell herbarium of fungi. Um, they're probably gonna be very small, not conducive for recreational purposes, so feel free to just donate them to science. So this list, there's a number of different species that aren't currently represented in the San Mitchell herbarium of fungi, which brings me to my next section, which is Telluride's most wanted. And I want you to go out and hunt down a lot of these mushrooms, largely for a number of different reasons. Um, if you find species of telostoma, these stalked puffballs, keep out, keep looking out for them. We're in a good place for them. There's lots of somewhat arid habitats outside of here. Um, and we are pretty much going to be a center of diversity for a lot of these different species. We have a couple of them occurring in uh, the herbarium at the San Mitchell Herbarium of Fungi, but I'm largely putting this plug out for um, Amy Honan, who works up in Gunnison, and she's working on her PhD dissertation focusing on um, the, the genus Telostoma. She will be talking later today, this afternoon, here in this hall around 1.30. So that's a little shameless plug for her talk. If you can part with your chanterelles, we have what's called, or what's on the list is a chanterellus, a chanterellus sabarius. The reality is the Cantharellus sabaris is the generic name for all the yellow mushrooms. We imagine that there is a ton of cryptic diversity, and I've been involved in research projects in the Midwest that have described numerous new species of Cantharellus that have been traditionally called sabarius. The thing is, is that there are subtle morphological differences in a lot of these different species, which will probably speak to their um, their diversity. While they're all yellow and they're all this fluted shape and they all look like chanterelles, there's probably likely a diversity of them out there, but you won't see unless you're willing to just sort of like leave them out on the display table so we can actually see the diversity. So if you get a mother load, take a small portion of that, leave it on the display table, and we'll see how much diversity we can actually have here at Telluride and on the Southern Rockies. Flocularia pitcanensis. It's on the list. Um, we don't have any collections from this region of Colorado in the San Mitchell Herbarium. Um, but the name pitcanensis is for Pitkin County, which is, of course, north of here in the southern Rockies on the western slopes. So getting a under better understanding of the species uh, distribution would be really nice. It's fairly large. It's got like a, a scaly cap, scurfy margins around the end. It will likely be a white spore print. Um, looks like a lot like a tricholoma. <clears throat> but go ahead and find these nice big mushrooms and then bring them in and we'll identify them. So how many of you are familiar with this fungus, Chlorosaboria? Yeah, it's a beautiful fungus. Look for wood that's stained green, specifically, speci especially it's something like an aspen groves, down logs, whatever. The reality is you might not see these asco carps, these green emerald structures right away, but if you find a nice um, wet log and you see a little bit of green on it, what you wanna do is start flipping it over, maybe tearing it open a little bit. And then all of a sudden you probably maybe see these little cups coming out and saying hi to you. Um, 
and these are beautiful largely because of, and they're sought after in some ways, because of their wood and how green it stains. We actually kind of want to get some collections of this wood to put on display at Denver Botanic Gardens. So if you can find some of this and bring it to the display tables, that would be really awesome. And then lastly, this might be a pie in the sky kind of find. Um, but Henningsomyces candidus is not reported from the Southern Rockies in Colorado. But we find it in the, um, the Sierra Nevada amongst white fir in the ground. They produce very tiny teeth with these little small tubes in them. And these are the fruiting structures of these fungi. Very delicate, very elegant. Um, but it's curious because... We have lots of white fur in the San Miguel Mountains here in Colorado. So I'm curious why it's abundant, or we find it in the springtime at least, in the Sierra Nevada, but we don't have any reports of it here. Now, it's probably strictly a springtime fungus, so we might not find it now. But if you're from the Telluride region, or you live or, occur, or find yourself in this part of the country around springtime, look in the fur, white fur stands and then see if you can find this Hennings of My Seas Candidus. And if you do, please get in touch with me. One of the oddest things is that while it's in the Sierra Nevadas and not here, I've had colleagues say that they found it in Guyana, in northern South America, in the Dicembe forests there. Like, what's up with that? Like, why isn't it here? So... Um, I like to think that these things are around, that there's still a lot more similarities that we, than we know of between mountain ranges like the Southern Rockies and the Sierra Nevadas. It's just that we need more eyes on the ground. Which brings us to the opportunities. And this is where I come up with the hashtag, we need more mycology. We need more people out there helping us understand and capturing this diversity because we can't be everywhere at once. And this is where citizen scientists are going to help a lot. And so one of the reasons why I developed this or been working on this aspect of the macro funga of Colorado, I'm working with the San Mitchell Herbarium of Fungi and I want to use it as sort of like a base of operations to do all of this sort of work in terms of better understanding fungal diversity. Everything from the DNA barcoding and how it might feed into doing biodiversity research, conservation research, and also mentoring student research to sort of public outreach aspects, working with citizen scientists to help represent the diversity, and also upgrading um, our museums in terms of their representation of what's going on with mycology. So I submitted an NSF proposal to help us better, um, to hopefully help fund this project and help expand a lot of these ideas and this synergistic approach to working on establishing a better understanding of the region's biodiversity. And so I had this, this beautiful and noisy and complicated figure that I put in the proposal, and I'll, I'll just walk through a little bit of it right now. And this top part is essentially this biodiversity documentation aspect. Half of it is the citizen scientists, which is where you guys can come in. And then the other part is the DNA barcoding, which I'm happy to ha include you guys on, um, but a lot of it's going to be done in-house at the Denver Botanic Gardens. But essentially, biodiversity documentation, like I said before, is going to help where we can get people out in these sparse areas or these other parts of the Southern Rockies that are likely to harbor lots of diversity, like I just said before with the Henningsomyces issue. And get these black dots covering a lot of the different parts of the state. And a lot of it also helps us interact with the, the public through things like the Colorado Mycological Society's Mushroom Fair, which we had last Sunday, which is a great event. And then also here at Telluride, um, getting people involved here at Telluride. Some of you might know some of these familiar faces. There's Rick right there. He'll be talking next. Um, some of you might be familiar with Eddie. He's a regular fe figure. He's going to be volunteering. You might see his face around. He, um, along with Amy Honan, who will be talking later, helped me voucher materials last year. Last year was pretty dry, so some of the tables were a little bit bare. But this year, hopefully we'll see nice full tables and a lot of diversity out there. So bring your Rocky Mountain Mushrooms books and be prepared to uh, learn and study the mushrooms. We also want to sort of help train people to not just dump a bunch of mushrooms on the table, 
Um, lots of beautiful diversity gets put onto the table, but it gets lost. It doesn't get captured because we don't know where it came from, when it came from, and who it came from. Um, and that's why we're providing these voucher slips. Rick will talk more in depth about that. And we'll also be talking about a little bit more of how to use iNaturalist. So stick around for Rick's talk, which is next. Um, and he'll be the, the main cheerleader and give you lots of sort of instructions and information about how to contribute to this. When you're collecting, and I want to emphasize this a little bit more, there's two things we want you to do. Keep specimens separate. We don't want mixed collections because that's a problem. So if you have, if you need wax paper bags, come see us. So have a bunch of um, recycled wax paper bags. Ideally, you can also maybe get tackle boxes too. And um, maybe in the future we'll have the Sam Mitchell Herbarium will sponsor a little award, so like the best collectors um, will get awarded with a tackle box with a Sam Mitchell sticker. How about that? The next thing, dig, don't pick. Um, your commander in chief, Britt Bunyard, would really like to emphasize this because his his fungi, the Amanitas, really rely on you getting down in the dirt, digging these things out from underground and getting at the base of the fungus, because it's the base and these structures, hopefully that some of you on this side can't quite see, but it's this base that's gonna have a lot of important features for identifying the fungus. So please, don't be a picker, okay? <laughs> Nobody likes a picker. So the other half of this biodiversity documentation is doing DNA barcoding there's lots of different aspects to the DNA barcoding, and like I mentioned before, it helped us with that Alloclavaria purpurea identification problem. But one of the things the NSF career proposal wants you to do is do more education and outreach, and this is a great opportunity to get things like undergraduate research students and high school students into the laboratory and grinding up tissues and learning how to use technology to get DNA sequence data out. So there is a plethora of potential slave labor out there that you can utilize to sequence all of these fungi. And I've also got ideas on how to try to use next generation sequencing um, to help advance our understanding or get more volume in terms of sequencing going on. And so far our progress has done pretty good. We started off with this low hanging fruit of sequencing all of the specimens in Vera's book, uh, Mushrooms of the Rocky Mountain Region. If you don't have this book, go get it. All of these specimens, or all of these species that are in our book, are actually based on vouchers that are in the Sam Mitchell Herbarium. So when we started asking the question, where do we start in terms of the DNA barcoding, this was an obvious first point to start off with. So when it comes to progress, um, we have about, um, of the specimens we have sequenced, we were able to get sequence data from about 74% of the specimens. The ones that we weren't able to get um, sequence data from, a lot of it comes from the fact that there's just not good DNA coming out of the specimens, so we get no PCR amplification. And then when there's some bio biology issues with the other half of the specimens because there's these issues like frame shifts that prevent the, the technology from effectively reading the data. Um, but in the, from the good sequences, what we see is that 70% of the specimens we get sequence of are matches or strong matches to what she's identified in the book. Others are questionable matches. Sometimes we say questionable because they change or the reference database that we're using, which is GenBank, um, has bad identification for their sequences. Um, so those are things that can be resolved. The bad matches are ones where we will probably need to resolve, but so far like a 5% bad match is actually not really bad not really that bad for us. It's a pretty good um, bar to, um, to reach in terms of the total number, it's saying 95% good or pretty good in terms of the identification. And so lastly, the bottom half of this figure, I've got the biodiversity research and then the public outreach. And when it comes to the biodiversity research, there's lots of questions to be asked. Um, we've got lots of questions that are, many of them have been framed in a recent paper by Dr. Kerry Andrew. Um, and they can address anything from phenology, when different species of fungi come up during the year, what do different seasons look like? And with our understanding of how climate might be, the climate might be changing, how is the phenology changing over time? Herbarium records can really help us understand these problems. 
what are the distribution patterns? Um, Flocularia pitkinensis, we know occurs in Pitkin County, and we believe it occurs in Telluride, but we don't have any collections. Um, ecology and substrate usage and conservation and all of these other issues, natural history collections like the sandwich or barium of fungi can contribute to myriads of um, biological questions when it comes to fungal diversity. And a lot of these collections that occur in the herbarium represent the vast majority of soil-dwelling fungi. Um, Leo Tedersu is an Estonian. He did this science paper where he took soil from all over the world and sequenced the DNA in it and categorized what the fungi that were in all of these different soil types. Over 50% of the world, of the soil around the world, come from the agaricomycetes, which are the mushroom forming clade of fungi. So, some of this might be the result of the technology that's going out there, but there is a ton of diversity when it comes to fungi. And part of the problem is, is that we don't have enough sequence records of what those fungi actually are. If we sequence the DNA out of the collections, then we can start identifying what the fungi are in the soil and do better at understanding distribution. This comes up with the issue of dark taxa, because these sequencing technologies are finding lots of fungi that we don't have identifications for. Um, so this paper by Martin Ryberg and Henrik Nielsen started talking about the issue of dark taxa in our databases. And Leho Tedersu's other paper, which is probably hard to see, but all of these red lines and clades, these are all soil, these are all sequence data from soil fungi. And the red bars represent unidentified species. The black bars represent um, sequence data that we can actually connect or name based on a sequence that's already in the databases. But all the red lines are sequences that are not currently in databases. If we start sequencing our herbarium collections and adding them to the databases, a lot of these red lines will become black. So lastly, what I want to talk about is the public outreach and how we can better communicate to the public about the importance of fungi. When you go to museums, like um, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, there's these dioramas which talk about the beautiful mammals and the beautiful animals, your Disney-esque kind of pictures. You have these giant mooses, um, deers and their habitats, and to a degree, um, they'll talk about the plants and the plant habitats that these um, animals belong in. Um, in the Denver Museum of Nature Science, there's one tiny window display that shows fungi and says, fungi are important, please move on. <clears throat> and in all of these other dioramas, there's only one fungus that's guarded by this giant moose. And what I'd like to do is remedy some of these issues because this is a great way to sort of interact with the public and explain to the public how important fungi are and how they can interact with fungi better. Um, same thing with Denver Botanic Gardens. Um, in the Botticher Memorial, Memorial Conservatory, which is sort of a tropical conservatory, there's one little display that talks about um, fungi and their cycles and supporting life. So what I'm considering and what I propose doing is you can create apps where people can interact um, with the environments, with the dioramas. And so you can click on a QR code, which might be on the little display here, with your phone. And it can take you to an app where it can show, maybe draw in the images in sort of a virtual reality context that by putting this maybe this Felinus tremuli on this aspen right here in this diorama. And there's also this augmented reality options where you can, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there's this libraries of life, these libraries of life cards that are out there. And if you get the library of life app and look at this card with the app, and I did this on my phone, you can get a three dimensional image popping up out of your phone. And it comes with a little heads up display which you can interact with on your phone. And as a result, you're starting, to, you're starting to see this world through your phone in ways that you've never seen before. So one of the things I'm imagining is if you're in the Botticher Memorial Conservatory, we have this big sort of funky tropical tree. It's actually made out of concrete, sort of just to mimic a tropical environment. But I'm imagining an area where you've got this virtual reality app where you're scanning it and you're looking at the tree through your phone, but all of a sudden you scan down and then the ground opens up and you're seeing this 
root system. And on the roots are all of these little mycorrhizal fungi that are interacting and you see nutrients coming up from the fungus and into the tree and you see the sugars from the tree going into the fungus. I think it would be a very fun interactive tool and especially if you want to shape it for like school groups that come in all the time. Doing this for both the Denver Botanic Gardens and um, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science I think would help you know, stress to um, the public the importance and the ubiquitous of fungi that are out there. And so this is another example of it just sort of popping out of my computer. There's lots of different ways of interacting and developing these augmented reality things. So um, in sort of final closings, what I just wanted to ask all of you who are in here and interested in the Microfloor project is to contribute. We're working hard to sort of develop the infrastructure for the Microfloor project and asking people to um, have patience in our, ass, in our ability to integrate you guys as citizen scientists. But largely, like I said before, you know, work on collecting specimens and then filling out data slips. Rick will talk about that in a lot of detail. And so with that, I want to thank you for coming to my talk. I want to thank a couple of people. Um, Nick Elias is instrumental in creating our logo for the mycoflora. I will uh, maybe... We'll change that to the macro fungo project, Juliana. That's down the line. We've got lots of stickers, so the Mycoflora project stickers will become a rare item, so collect them while you can. Um, just come and see us. And then I also want to thank Jesse Berta Thompson. She was instrumental in creating a lot of these maps that I showed you of Pitkin County and um, San Miguel County and the distribution maps and figures. Um, and I also want to, you know, um, thank colleagues and collaborators and encourage you to see a couple other talks that are coming up. Uh, Dr. Alicia Quant, she's on Saturday. She'll talk about um, cordyceps fungi and how these fungi engage in mind control. Mm -hmm. That's cool stuff. And then um, Dr. Ken Kassenbrock and Elks Lodge will talk about mushroom collecting 101. So that should be really good stuff. Thank you.